uh, all of you to close your laptops and phones and put them down on the ground. Okay? All right. Back in 2010, uh, the scientists at the University of Michigan uh, made a great discovery that was published in the magazine Science that I'm sure many of you know. And it's about hand washing. Um, it went like this. A group of students were asked to, uh, to look at a, a 10 CDs, compact discs with music, and rate their quality. Then uh, they were told they could choose two of the CDs to keep. And then after a while, they were asked to rate the CDs again. And what happened is, is well described in psychology. It's what's called choice support, um, supportive bias, which is that just the simple act of choosing something makes you uh, rate it higher. So, so we like as people to justify our decisions. Uh, like we do that mentally without even thinking about it. Then they did the, the, the experiment again. 10 CDs, another group of students. Uh, they got to choose, they rated. But then they all uh, had to wash their hands. And lo and behold, afterwards, when they, were, you know, when they were to rate the CDs, the bias had gone. So suddenly, they weren't like, uh, confused about their, um, their ideas about music, um, which is a brilliant finding. It's wonderful, because uh, we have it in language. You know, we talk about washing our hands, which means like rel relieving ourselves of guilt. We know in, in Lady Macbeth, when she's uh, killed a bunch of people, she, uh, there's a famous scene where she, she tries to wash her hands and she cries to the skies, damn spots! And she can't get them off, of course, because, because the spots are on her soul. Wonderful finding. But the thing is, this is not really a story about hand washing, it's a story about truth. Because what we know now, uh, since the study was published in Science, is that for all we know, the finding is totally fictional. Hand washing has no effect at all um, on uh, your choice of CDs. Uh, but this, this result was published uh, you know, in media uh, across the world, probably in some of your uh, outlets. So that begs the question, you know, how, how, first of all, how do we know that? We know that because there was this great experiment where psychology researchers decided to try to replicate 100 studies around the world. Um, and I remember hearing about the results from those studies, and, and it, it turned out that out of the 100 studies, they could replicate 31, which is a terrible, terrible figure. So um, I remember hearing about it because I've always loved the idea of science. But, um, but it, that begs the question, you know, what went wrong? Well, first of all, there was nothing wrong with the experiments. They were done very well. Also, nobody thought that it were, there was like bad will on the, the side of the, the scientists because they, uh, they were very surprised that people couldn't replicate their findings. The problem was much more common. It was the problem of being human. And we as humans and as scientists and as journalists, we love causality. We love that this leads to this leads to this, because that's how we tell stories. Um, and let me show you. Let's, let's do an experiment. Now I'm going to ask you some questions, and if your answer is yes, I want you to stand up. Can you do that for me? Yes. How many of you would say that you, like on a monthly basis, eat kiwi? <laughs> yes, yes, somewhat popular fruit. Yes, you can sit down. Who would say that they, like on a weekly basis, have problems falling asleep? I know there was a, at least one person that both ate kiwi. You can sit down again. Eat kiwi and had problems falling asleep. So possibly, you know, could, could there be an effect from kiwi eating to, to falling asleep? Let's try something else. How many of you have had alcohol within the last 24 hours? <laughs> <laughs> Look at the panel. Sit down. <laughs> Welcome to Journalism Festival. <laughs> There's obviously a connection between alcohol and having problems falling asleep, I can say, because every, all those people, all those people stood up. And the final question, how many of you regularly check your smartphone while on the toilet? <laughs> That's transparency. Great people, sit down. Now, there could be a connection between using your smartphone and possibly having problems falling asleep, and maybe that leads to drinking more. You see, you get the point. 
the more questions you ask, the more uh, the more um, the more patterns will emerge. Patterns that leads to uh, storytelling in our minds, and that has a huge effect on science and on journalism. So what to do? What to do about this problem? Um, in science, uh, they're doing things. They've uh, made it uh, mandatory in, in, in most of medicine research to report your hypothesis before uh, you start doing the experiment. So you can't begin by studying the effects of kiwi and end up studying the effects of using smartphone on the toilet, which is a very good idea. No, I think the problem, the real problem, is the rest of us. Um, we have to be more aware of our love of causality for simple explanations, because the truth is that the world is a very, very random and chaotic place, much more than we like. And uh, as journalists, we must be suspicious and critical of our own minds, especially, unfortunately, when the stories are good. Unfortunately, it doesn't even help washing your hands. Thank you. So, you've just been part of a live journalism experiment, and if you were here expecting to hear about Facebook Live or Periscope or possibly satellite television, it now would be the time to head off. Um, <laughs> we get that all the time. Um, so, um, I'm Samir Padania, I'm your moderator for today. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of a back seat because these people are all the real experts at doing things in live settings and interacting with audiences and all kinds of things, as you'll find out over, co over the course of the next hour or so. But basically, I want to tell you why I brought this panel together. Um, I, among, you know, there are, I once read a piece about Pop-Up magazine in uh, the US. It was a sort of, it's a live magazine, and maybe uh, Florence might talk about it later. But, you know, it's a sort of, it's an, a physical experience, a theatrical experience. It's a magazine made into a physical experience and a space. And that idea intrigued me in terms of how, you know, when we talk about trust and credibility and engagement with audiences and things like that, that idea has sort of stayed with me. Why aren't more organizations doing this? Why aren't more organizations doing interesting and varied and wide events that genuinely involve and impassion their audiences? And so I hunted around and tried to find, particularly in Europe, places, organizations that do this. And you see some people here in front of you who are going to tell you about what they do in exactly that way in different parts of Europe. Uh, on the far left, you just heard Jakob Moll, who uh, is at Zetland, which is a, a Danish journalism startup and community, and he will tell you more about that, but they have enormous sort of 1,000 to 1,500 person events um, in theatres in Denmark. Uh, you've got Florence Martin Kessler, who runs Live Magazine, which is, I think, still Europe's only fully live and mobile magazine, maybe. Uh, Yuri Albrecht, who runs a space, a physical space in the heart of Amsterdam called De Bali. Uh, I've been there, I've eaten there, I've had lovely coffee there. And uh, it's a sort of former, I think a former law court, is that right? Building in the heart of Amsterdam, so it's a sort of debate and discussion space and uh, a venue in Amsterdam where different kinds of people come together and events are held. And he described himself once when I met him as the editor of a live magazine, and that's why he's here. And Joris Leyendijk is somebody who I know, and you may well know from his work with The Guardian. He d he's done a number of experiments in uh, a method he calls the learning curve, which is a sort of, if you like, a, a sort of web-based, long-form live experiment with lots of participants in it. And uh, he has also, I guess, inspired to some degree the correspondence method and model. That's, uh, I don't think that's a, not a matter of public record. And uh, was involved in, took part in a, uh, an event, a live event in Flanders called Savanten. And we'll see a little example. Everyone's going to show a little bit of, to give you a flavor of what live journalism events are like. And then they'll talk a little bit about the experience of, you know, what they, what live journalism means to them and, uh, you know, what it could be, where it could be going in the future and how it represents a new form of journalism that, that does something new. Okay, Florence.
Yeah, but the slides, the slides are not working, but maybe they will soon. <laughs> So just to uh, to first of all, so we have started this uh, live magazine in Paris three years ago, after being inspired by the this format that exists in America. So I didn't invent anything really. Um, we I wanted to show you a bit of uh, what it feels like to be there. Uh, we now uh, fill up uh, theaters that are uh, soon uh, 2,000 uh, seaters, so pretty big. And we have a policy of not recording the events, so all the pictures you'll see are from the rehearsals or maybe some people on Twitter who have cheated a little bit. So this is, uh, this is something we did last September in Paris City Hall. Uh, this is our regular 1200 uh, seater venue near Place de la République. Uh, we're moving to another place called Les Folies Bergères in Paris, which is very cool. Uh, this is what it feels to be a, a journalist uh, with a, a 1,500 pairs of eyes uh, watching you and being a bit terrified. And uh, so I've, I've prepared a little something. Uh, what is Live Magazine? Uh, it's reported stories told live, and every single word is really important. Probably stories, we really want stories, and not uh, exposés or blah, blah, or blah, 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 blah. So stories reported, we don't want people to talk about themselves or their experience or sell their book or be an expert or this and that. And told, because you have to connect to the audience. You're not uh, reading a slide or anything. And live, you have to bring the excitement of you know, being seated together in a dark place. Uh, we've done 17 shows in six cities in France and in Belgium. Uh, we usually go into uh, cool national theaters and uh, you know, magnificent Italian theaters. And we are always sold out. Uh, the show is 100 minutes. Usually you have between 10 and 15 journalists and authors who go on stage. Uh, we don't have any recipe. We, we like the stories to have never been told before, to be uh, inedit, uh, to be new. And they are edited very carefully by me and uh, a few other people on my team. So it's not like carte blanche and you come up and you do whatever you want. We edit the stories. Uh, we love multimedia, so it's always, uh, there is live music, there is a band, we change, sometimes electronic, last time it was classic piano, it could be lyrical singing. We have uh, sound music, we also try to push the boundaries of what it is to do journalism and how to perform it with, let's say, stories in WhatsApp, in tweets, in mimes, in dance, in, uh, so we, we try to reach out uh, for true stories. No captation, no replay, and so and there is no theme. It's like a general interest. So you have politics, international, um, and some crazy little thing that we try to to find. So there are a few pictures. This was a story that she actually she's a dancer. She danced a story. It was incredible. Uh, those girls are uh, info data viz. Uh, girls from Le Monde, and uh, I asked her, I want you to tell a story in maps. I don't want you to explain your job. And so they started by, uh, so they understood really quickly, and they started about the color red. What is the color red, and how do they choose their red for the Bataclan attack or for the migrant routes and all the red that they're doing, uh, you know, week after week? It was really cool. Sometimes we have lecterns, and we don't want to have people who are really good performers. This girl, Estelle Saget, she's a reporter at L'Express. She's incredibly timid. She told me the other day that she thinks she's Asperger. She, 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 but, but she has. Re but we, 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 anyone, you need to be true and uh, maybe a bit vulnerable. And she, she told one of the best story, and she just read our paper. She didn't have to, you know. She was reading, and the emotion in the room was incredible. She told the story of the, the last hour of the Kwashi brothers. I don't know if you remember, the Kwashi brothers are the two uh, guys who uh, killed the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, cartoonist uh, two years ago. 
And she had spent a lot of time with Michel Catalano, which was the, print, the owner of the printer press, where the two guys at the end of their run ended up, and who, how the decision he made to hide his employees and uh, not to get killed, I guess. And it's a story she could only tell herself and no one else could because, and Michel Catalano was in the audience and I could see him. It was really a, a crazy moment. This is a story in a song. This is a, Sergei is a cartoonist from Argentina, works for Le Monde as well. And uh, he, he, he told a story in the piano. He sang a story. It was cool. She's an historian. Sometimes we have academics. Uh, this is a love story from World War I, incredibly beautiful letters that she uncovered. Uh, and this is a link. Alors, qu'est-ce que tu m'as dit déjà, Jacob? Escape. So, shift et flèche, attends, shift et flèche. So uh, we'll tr try to, this guy I found uh, by scouting the internet he is uh, he's a mo motion capture uh, entrepreneur. And his little hobby in the evening is to construct 3D uh, lead uh, sculptures from the truth. So this is what you're going to see. It's really cool. One sec. So you can see his reading. Qui déplace les foules dans les stades. Oh la vache. <laughs> The guy saying, oh la vache. Tu l'as eu Oh la vache. So we, so we brought this sculpture, which is like an enormous little machine that he does. And uh, it's a real soccer player at a real game. So maybe it's not journalism, but at least it's a, ca it's a captation of a true moment. So, and we try to have him tell a story and not just uh, an expose about his motivations. Shift et flèche, okay. Voilà, I am back. Et maintenant, présentateur. Okay, I'm going to go a bit quicker now, maybe, for my friends to be able to speak. Um, another really cool story, but um, this is a story that couldn't be published in the newspaper because uh, the reporter, Aline Leclerc, whom, and also a little parenthesis, I contacted her because she's the one who did all the portraits of the killed kids in the Bataclan, and I wanted to try to have this inside, but she couldn't tell that story. She, it was too complicated, it's been really affecting her. So she told me another story that she could never publish, and Live Magazine, since it's not recorded, of course it's not off the record, but you, it's a good venue for things that you cannot publish elsewhere or tell elsewhere. So that was a cool story. This is before the show. It's incredibly stressful to go on stage. And this is like the backstage before where we all are trying. So what works? A story that no one else can tell. Uh, something about wonder and vulnerability. And uh, maybe you're going to say some a dilemma you had. People like to laugh. And we we're very... Um, it's important that the, you know, the table of content is very varied and that we, we work a lot on that also. And uh, immersive, people have to, you know, they arrive, they, they know they're going to be a hundred minutes uh, taken away by stories. And uh, you have to work on that to make it happen. So who am I? Uh, I, uh, I had several lives. <laughs> I come from. I, I started as a as a kind of finance person in a big tower. Didn't work out very well. Then I was into documentary filmmaking for 15 years. So I'm not per se a journalist, and maybe that gave me uh, this kind of uh, trust in stories. I was awarded a Neiman Fellowship, which kind of gave me the energy to uh, start a business, I guess. And I was trying to, you know, telev public television is very conservative, very expensive, and I wanted to do something that's quick to do. And, um, and that worked. And we, we, had, uh, we, started up in, we started the company in 2015, and we had uh, an investor, which was really cool, uh, last year. So revenue tripled in three years. Uh, Half of our business is ticket sales. We also have uh, partners, uh, yearly partners. We do sell um, shows for brands a little bit. And we also have tried to sell um, live advertising. And since it's a, like a magazine and you turn the pages, we thought it would be really cool to have a live advertising. 
we did that. And we also have an uh, operation in Belgium. Voila. Uh, so we are profitable, which is uh, unexpected. We've been doing, uh, we've been approached by every single uh, legacy newspaper in France. Les Echos, L'Equipe, Libération, and also abroad, the Financial Times, the New York Times, the Boston Globe. Uh, we have a partnership with Agence France Presse. We're doing a special next month for children 7 to 12. Uh, so we are being contacted also by uh, corporations. Voila, and uh, we had lots and lots and lots of uh, good, uh, sympathical uh, newspaper <laughs> profiles and stuff. Merci. Okay. Thank you, Florence. Um, now, Jacob from Zetland. Yes, uh, just a few words on, on, on who we are at Zetland. Um, uh, unlike, unlike Florence, we do, we do live journalism as a part of our like, like larger mission. So, uh, so most of the time what we do is publish a, a digital newspaper uh, in, this, in the like, we call ourselves a cousin, like a little bit smaller cousin to the correspondent in the Netherlands that some of, some of you know. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's making sense of what's going on in the world. It's, it's, we don't do classic news, but like analytical feature or context journalism. Uh, focusing on perspective and nuance and complexity and some other things that news journalism, we believe, sometimes fails to do. Um, we're 23 employees and we launched this a, a year ago. We've been doing live shows for, for five years. And it's fun because most of what Florence says goes 100% for what we're doing in Denmark and we've never talked before this conference. So we've, so we've, we've sort of like gotten to somewhere very, very similar, as you'll see in two seconds, uh, without, you know, independently. So I think that says something about... Um, that some of them are good ideas. Um, so, uh, as I said, opposed to Florence, live is not the only thing, but it's a very important thing to what we are we're trying to achieve: uh, making, uh, building a relationship with our with our uh, paying members and and recruiting new members that get it, that, that we engage with. And it looks something like uh, this. We live in a time where this can be or weighed tæller mere end det, der kan mærkes og føles. Vi lever i testenes tid, vi lever i regneagtenes tid, vi lever i vækstens tid. Vores bruttonationalprodukt kan måle jo alt undtagen det, der virkelig gør livet værd at leve. Og med disse ord, velkommen til Zetland Live. Live musik giver gåsehud. På vej væk derfra havde jeg svært ved at tro på, at jeg var sluppet væk, og jeg lovede mig selv, at jeg aldrig nogensinde ville vende tilbage til Afghanistan. Den oprindelige befolkning i Australien spiller en helt central rolle i debatten om, hvordan spredte mennesket sig ud på jorden. Nu til slut det ordentligt af. Det skal man i politik og i direktionen. Ja. Han kunne lige at gå til nettet, og det, og det skulle man passe på med mod lentet, for se! Det vigtige er ikke, hvem din held er. Det vigtige er, at du har en held. Det var fordi, at da jeg interviewede Svend Arben, mødte et menneske, som lå og skulle dø men var overbevist om, at han havde brugt sit liv på det helt rigtige. So that's that's from a show that's a, a couple of years old, which has had, had sort of a circusy feel, but um, 
but we do a lot of different things. So the basic facts are we do two shows a year. Uh, at the time, 12 to 14 stories, very similar to Florence. And both of our shows have been either um, one-off or, um, or just like a few shows, different places in, uh, in Denmark. And I can talk a lot about how it makes a lot of sense to have a physical presence as a digital company. Um, but basically, when we began, it was because it was fun. And uh, we liked that. So uh, we, we were 200 people at the French Venue and, and free tickets to begin with. And then every time since, for all the 12 shows, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the stories is the same. We use different formats, uh, sound, video, storytelling, audience engagement, and whatever you can think of. On the left, one of our journalists is telling a story about space-time, uh, using a staircase and flying around on the stage. And, and then we have the fastest heavy metal guitar player in Denmark. Uh, uh, as, as an illustration of like high frequency trading, we try to use him to, to show something about the speed of trading on Wall Street. Um, we always have uh, music, as you could see. Uh, this we, we always try to tell stories uh, around that contextualized music. This is a story about how Shostakovich, the, the, the Soviet-era composer, was actually considered to write political music, political, political classical music, which is an interesting thing. How that can you know how classical music can be political. Um, we edit our stories as well. Uh, sometimes we do interviews, uh, which is a very diff a difficult format because interviews that are planned can very easily feel like watching television on on stage, which is very very boring. Uh, so it has to have like an authentic feel and something uh, something uh, unknowable and and surprising about it. So so most of our stories are, are edited in in, in detail. Um, we've tried many different uh, venues. We've done one open air show, and um, well, the point is to make it feel as little as a conference as possible. Uh, this room would be very, very bad for live journalism. Um, this is our favorite place, the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen, uh, because something happens when you take this high brow surroundings and and put uh, put journalism uh, into them, and especially if you make people do things that they don't expect to do in those surroundings. Uh, we'd use uh, creative barriers. Uh, this is me doing the same story as I just did on you uh, in a, in a theater where we decided to do a show without a screen, which was a very, very uh, difficult and we needed help from, from theater professionals. And the final and most important picture. Um, this is the connection that we want to make with the audience. Um, and when, when this is happening, we're building trust, we're building loyalty, and uh, we're even building excitement. And uh, I think at this moment in time, building excitement around serious journalism is something that, uh, that we can use, and it's also uh, very good for business. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Um, now we're going to move to Yuri Albrecht of the Bali in Amsterdam, which is, an, is a dedicated venue, as he's going to explain. Yeah, it works. Yeah, uh, let's see whether we can have some. Mm -hmm. Slides? Yeah, no, no, we can't. Um, no. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm going to go run very quickly through these slides because I could show you exactly sort of the same things uh, you've seen just now, um, which is amazing because uh, we haven't talked to each other and we do exactly the same sort of things in Amsterdam and the Bali. Um, uh, the Bali is a venue. It's a place on the Leidseplein in Amsterdam. The Leidseplein is the main theatre square in Amsterdam. Uh, uh, something like the Leicester Square in London is the Leidseplein in Amsterdam. And we have been there for 35 years. It uh, came about, it's an art center. And it came about because it was occupied, squatted, because it was an old courthouse. The courthouse moved out to the outskirts of the town and it would have been flattened and it would have been a hotel built, if not for some artists, to occupy it and make it into an art center 35 years ago. And when I came six years ago, um, uh, um, uh, it was still there and um, it has been perceived as, um, uh, as, an, as a, uh, a think tank, a political theater, 
or a, um, or a, a, a breeding ground for new initiatives, new theater groups, new initiatives. And we still all that. We, we, we call ourselves a think tank, but what we really are is a live magazine. And uh, I consider myself the chief editor. We have a, an editorial meeting every Tuesday morning, come hell or high water. We have, uh, uh, all the editors are there. We're with 14 editors, and we make a live magazine every day. We have a thousand live events every year. And we had 30,000 paying visitors six years ago. We had 200 thousand in 2006 and we live of our cafe we live of our restaurant and um, we uh, got 10 percent subsidy from the town and we make 90 percent of the money ourselves and the ticket is an important part of it but we try to sell the tickets as cheap as possible because we want to reach so there are 10 guilders and seven guild uh, uh, 10 euros and 7 euro 50 uh, because uh, we think that we need to get an audience in the period of their life where their, where their opinions are still formed. So we want to have people from 18 years onward where, and if they study and who can't afford a big ticket because it's the period in your life where you need to be in contact with new ideas, with great ideas, with old ideas. With So uh, this is the venue. Um, we, um, uh, we base it, at least I base it on a magazine idea which we have three live events every day. And it's also the way we finance the whole building and the whole thing. Um, there's uh, simple, uh, small gatherings, there's big gatherings like you, like you just saw a few a year. Um, uh, we, this is the cafe. Um, we have things late at night. And we have things sometimes in the middle of the night. We have interview marathons. We go through the night till the dawn because it gives this very special atmosphere. If you, if you talk with each other on one topic till the dawn breaks. We did that on Europe just before the Brexit vote. Um, uh, we have all sort of uh, international newspapers because um, uh, we think that we are like the old Vienna Cafe, the place where it's as important that you uh, be in hall and talk to each other and can talk to each other on the bar. If there's a, an important writer, an important actor, an important polit political man or woman, and you can actually meet them afterwards in the bar. So the bar is a part of what we call the third half, and it's, the, it's maybe maybe even more important than what's on stage, that you can meet people live and talk to them and interact with them. Of course, it's very important what we bring, and we, th we consider ourselves live journalists. Um, um, this, for instance, um, we've done with uh, 10 actors. Um, we wrote a piece, uh, it, I would say a big essay on political statements on what Europe can be and is, be, has been and, 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 and is. And everybody said, you're crazy, nobody's going to come. But we put it on the internet, and in half an hour it was sold out. We had 10 actors reading François Mitterrand, um, Vaclav Havel, um, and Margaret Thatcher. And people said, you know, nobody will come. But they did. They did. Of course, I mean, it helped that Jude Law was one of the actors. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but in a way... Um, this is one of the marathons we do with Rem Kolhaas. We interviewed for 12 hours in a row, uh, uh, what is Europe about? Uh, uh, Rem and a, a professor of political science and me did a 12-hour interview with 60 people talking about what is Europe. And um, um, uh, uh, we had Kurt Westergaard, we had um, uh, talking about uh, what it is to, to make fun of, what it is to make fun about things. Um, uh, it was a hell of an op operation, uh, Mahit Navas. Um, uh, we, we, we got a lot of problems lately with um, security. And that's really a, a danger for live journalism because it's live, it's there, and you're vulnerable, very vulnerable, and it can be very, very dangerous. And it's becoming more and more dangerous. It's something which really worries me about live journalism. Uh, well, this is, our, uh, this is this again, I think, the European essay we did. Um, um, uh, we, and what we call ourselves um, a live magazine, but also an art center. So we do, we try almost everything to do with artists and with public servants, politicians, lawmakers to, uh, to have this interaction, because the interaction is important. Um, well, I just uh, flip you through it. It's, um, you, you can imagine after you've seen the beautiful things we've just seen, the beautiful films, what sort of things we do. Um, and I I want to add one thing, maybe also for the discussion. I think um, you could say that in the post-truth society, um, uh, a truth is very important for trust. Without truth, no trust. And what live journalism does is build trust, because you see people, you meet people. And, um, uh, and because you meet them, uh, people suddenly realize that though they have different opinions, there are people, and there's much more common ground. So it's building trust. And trust 
And without trust, you don't have justice, and without justice, you don't have democracy. So I think we're a, a very important stone in sort of the, the chain where you have to build uh, uh, for a democracy, where you have to build trust. And that's what live journalism ideally does. It's one of the important parts of the chain of, um, of journalism. And since we're living in this post-truth society, um, uh, and suddenly it dawned on everybody that it's important to get back to truth and to trust. No truth, no trust. And it's funny because six years ago when I started, I, I told the editors that the Bali would work under the idea of Vaclav Havel, where he wrote in 1978, he wrote this beautiful piece on trying to live in truth. That's how it was translated in Dutch. The original version is actually a power of the powerless, his essay. Um, it's his answer to a truthless society in which he lived in 1978. A truthless society which was a totally post-totalitarian society, the Czech Slovak Republic. And if you see, um, um, if we take that as a leading idea for live journalism, the, the trying to live in truth, and it's actually living in truth because you're doing it at the moment. I think that's the motto we work for and it's becoming more and more um, uh, 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 necessary. And you can see that from the success. We had 30,000 tickets sold uh, six years ago. We have 200,000 tickets sold last year. So you see that there's a, a need for it. I'll leave it with this um, and uh, uh, hope to talk to you uh, afterwards. Thanks, Yuri. Now Yoris uh, is going to talk about the event in Flanders, as I mentioned, which is called Savanten. And we're going to show a little video about halfway through. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you much for, ha for having me. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting uh, phenomenon that started in Berlin and is now, has been done in, in Flanders a few times. And it's quite simple, essentially. You've got a stage with 20 tables. Um, the organizers have invited around 60 experts, savanta as they call them. They can be anything from paleontologists to but also activists and so on. And what happens in the run-up to the event is that visitors can book an appointment with these experts. And so they sit at these tables and they're round. So as, an, as a savant, I was one of them, um, you, you, you have an appointment, then you can you know, have a drink, then you come back, you have another round. And what happens is that because of now the technology, it's possible to have these directional microphones. So these 20 tables, each of them are recorded. And if you're in the audience, you haven't made an appointment with an expert, you can choose which table to listen to. And there are also four of them are being filmed. So you also see some of the faces. But in most theaters, you can see the actors on stage, so you can see the experts as well. And there's, there's some really interesting dynamics there. Um, one is that, um, but maybe yeah, we can show the video. I'm so verbal, I always forget to show the video. My assistant. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks to the headphones, um, Jimmy, you can see the, the names there. And so I found myself going back and forth between three people I found interesting. And uh, one of the really um, striking outcomes was that you, what you do is you remove the journalist. So a journalist is usually the facilitator, but also the filter and the framer between source and audience. And here, uh, audience and source comes together. So there was this paleontologist, and then there was this gentleman who just sat down and says, right, so I'm, am I ever going to see a live dinosaur again? Now, as a journalist, you cannot ask that question because the paleontologist will think, you superficial fool, why haven't you read up? Because, you know, we're professionals, we're meant to prepare ourselves, and so we're never going to ask that question. Even if we ask that question, the dynamics are very different from just someone in the street who bought a ticket to the Savantin Festival and wanted to know this. Uh, just like when, you're, when, when I'm explaining something to my 10-year-old daughter, I'm trying to pitch my answers to her, what I think is her level of knowledge. And so it, out came very different conversations between experts and our audience than you would usually have. And I think this, this model, which is quite low-tech in that, well, it wasn't possible 20 years ago with the microphones, but nowadays I think can be used in lots of different ways. And in, one thing um, where it, it, it may really help us is that 
I think what has, the yeah, last year has shown is that millions and millions of people across the West no longer trust us. And they associate us with the politicians they no longer trust. And I find that most, most of our answers are about, well, we should, should just simply double down on what we've always done. We should be better fact checkers, da 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 da. I don't think that that is going to be the way to gain back trust. I think we need to meet with the populist voters. And I think this would be a very low-tech way of just bringing over your newsroom, 40 of your journalists, go someplace where there are lots of populist voters, and just go out and say, will you please tell us what we're doing wrong so that you no longer trust us? And then you have all these conversations, and you tape them, and you sit, ba you sit back. And I think you, this will allow you to harvest insights that are very difficult to, to um, garner otherwise. Also, because as you can tell from here, we are, as journalists right now, such an homogenous group. Yes, we bring in some, we managed to bring in first women and now people of ethnic minorities, but they've all gone through the same kind of education, they all aspire to belong to the same kind of social cultural class, and we need to break out of that class. And I think this, this Savanton, a method of putting down these tables, can be a way to, to suddenly hear what is happening outside our comfortable sort of TEDx bubble. And so, uh, yeah, I think this is, I'm going to try and set up uh, a number of these things in, in the near future. I've already done similar things on, on the internet, which was more long form, then also has, has advantages if you sit people down and they can take the time to type their answer. You get a very different dynamic. I think it will be fireworks if you put uh, people from the liberal elite together with populist voters on stage. I mean, it'll be really interesting, but it'll also, it, it, it probably requires some training on the part of journalists because they'll be attacked and we're, as journalists we're really not used to being criticized. We like to criticize others. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's a really promising, uh, simple to copy technology, um, which I would really recommend. Okay, thank you, Joris. Thank you, everybody. I, I mean, that to me feels like the, the, the sort of heart you know, for obvious reasons, you, you know, we've got more and more and more into this relationship of trust between audiences and the media formerly known as journalists, or I don't know what we're calling them. Um, so I, I, I wanted you to drill in a little bit more. You know, you've, at the one end you've got for at Zetland and with Live Magazine, sort of experiential journalism. You're, you're g taken into a place, you're given a... A defined period of time, and you're, it's, it's, it's an end, in one sense, it's an entertainment. And at the other end, we're talking about, you know, and across the span, you know, some of the, some of, you know, and Dabali somewhere in the middle, and then I think the Savantan experience is really an unfiltered, direct engagement, as you say, between a source and the public. So, where, when you look at what each other are doing, what does it tell you about what you're doing? When you look at what, I mean, there are obviously echoes and commonalities, but where do you see, oh gosh, you know, I'm, we're not connecting with people in this way, or we're not piercing a bubble, or we're not, what do you, what do you look at what the others are doing and feel what you're not doing? Um, well, I thought it was very interesting because we, we, we're thinking about this, um, that you don't um, uh, um, uh, air it on the internet. We air everything we do on the internet, almost everything. And so it's there, it's there for everybody to see. And we think it's a matter of principle that it's also um, uh, transparent, that everybody can see what we do, that what's discussed, that it's not. Um, um, but, it, but it takes away um, uh, something um, uh, uh, important that it's just a one-off. Though everything we do is one-off, so it never comes back. So if you want to be there, and I think the physical experience is very important, like the catharsis which happens if you're there, the, the exchange, the building of trust. But we think it's important that you air it on the internet, and sometimes 100,000 people watch uh, a, 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 a one piece of it, or pieces of it, or um, so. I, and we're discussing this whether we we should stop doing this because it adds intimacy, or whether it's good, um, or whether um, you, you you because if it's transparent, you build more trust as well because people can uh, check it. It's something obviously we've been uh, thinking a lot about because uh, we've touched ten thousand people. Uh, you know, it's a lot, but at the same time, it's it's not a mass media. So now we are bringing kids from the banlieue. 10% of the audience are kids to the banlieue. We've set up uh, a little academy. Because stories, the kids, uh, teenagers, love Life magazine because 
they cannot believe that they're going to actually see the journalists. We also do a party after that, like a open bar thing, which works really well. And so then the journalists, they pick a journalist from the stage that goes to their actual classroom. And so it's just like, wow. They, it's, and we have a, we work with teachers, so it's very elaborate. It's not just the journalists coming and blah, blah, blah. They, it's really engaged. And But of course, we we Kept, we keep being asked, why don't you do li uh, Facebook Live? Uh, you know, uh, please, uh, it's an elite thing, and it's 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 something that we're thinking about. But it's true that uh, it you know it's kind of a compromise. I'm sure. How long before you play the Stade de France? Écoute, déjà les. <laughs> No, but seriously, I think we could feel we're always sold out days and days in advance. And if we pair with those legacy media, we can touch more, you know, tons of people. So I'm sure we could feel the Stade de France eventually. We've we've talked a lot about uh, video as well, and we've 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 tried to record uh, some of our shows as as tests. And the problem is that it's it's sometimes it's a little bit like theater for us. Theater and, and the television was very big in the. 50s, I think, but it's 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 really not always great television or, or great great video. So so we're trying to do um, this fall. We're trying to do a show where we take like specific segments that that we then like for, like format to make them really work, sort of like inspired by TED talks. Uh, but but we we found that that we have to if you want to make videos really really work, you have to 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 do a setup that's where where you're looking. You know, the camera is is sort of like the center of attention. So it's great if you have so many views on on, on, on what you're doing and streaming it, but but I think um, I think you, you could easily um, do something that wouldn't work that well. But but at the same time, it's a, it's a huge dilemma because we're doing these magical shows and and but it's it's high end uh, journalism for for the well educated. So I'm uh, I I just want to do what you're doing. But the, the incredible thing is that people, we are bombarded with news and this is something that you have to take into consideration because this is like the battle for attention. And during those 100 minutes, people are so attentive and open and we don't even have to tell them to turn off their phones because they, you know, it's really rare that we have something on Twitter. <laughs> And they, they will, like, years later, they will remember the exact sentences of the story. I cannot tell you how powerful this is. They will come to me and they'll say, when Estelle told this dialogue, it's like you have goosebumps. And the thing is also with recording, when you go to a concert, you know, it's exciting to be together sharing something. And also, I think it's important the party after because... I think before maybe everybody in a small town in America was reading the same op-ed and column and news and now we are spread out like puzzles and to share something and to be able at the end to say, ah, what did you like best? Really? Uh, no, really? What do you think? Nya, nya, nya. So there is this kind of shared moment and people do the little podiums and I think it's a success when no one tells me they love the same stories because uh, that means that there's a little bit and since the stories are really short, less than eight minutes, even if it's, and if it's sometimes the speaker fail and, you know, it's not as good as it, but people know, the audience know that they are giving really their best, that everybody is trying to, and so there is this really kind of um, acceptance. You don't have to be like Steve Jobs doing a perfect thing. We like imperfection and, and the audience like the imperfect feel of it, I guess. How does it work in relation to, I mean, we, the how, we met, Jakob, was through, I was working as an assessor for the Digital News Initiative, the Google Fund, and I interviewed him as an applicant, but we ended up talking less about the application and more about the live journalism. And it was quite an interesting experience because you were saying about the relationship of doing live journalism events and then translating that in your application. I don't think I'm breaking any taboos or any... Uh, DNAs, NDAs, um, DNAs, <laughs> whose DNA am I not breaking? Um, <laughs> destroying my own DNA. Um, but you, what you were saying was that it, doing the live events was teaching you new things about how to do engagement and uh, connection with people online, both through a membership and in reaching out to reach new audiences. So I want to 
if you so, could talk a bit about well, that. Well, one of the great things about being a startup compared to legacy media, where, where I also have my background, is that there's, you can be very clear about what you're trying to achieve and, 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 and why you're doing it. So basically, um, we began early on doing these shows, and, and, and what, what we're trying to do digitally is, is basically to translate the experience of like the relationship you get by looking people in the eye and being in a room together and, and having a conversation, and to try to move that into the digital space. So, so, so what we're doing online is, 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 is basically to try to make things felt like they're built by humans which is actually sometimes quite hard in, on, online, uh, to have a tone of voice that resembles the, the, the tone of voice we have um, as people and meeting our sources. So it's like, it's like the same thing all over. So, so as a business we use, it, I, I, I know it's the same with Florence, it's actually kind of hard to make a business out of, out of live journalism if you're, if you're being really ambitious, at least in the way we're doing it, because we, we can't get subsidized by the Danish government the way theatre and opera things are, because it's not theatre from, like, from a governmental uh, perspective. Also, we can't get subsidized the way journalism is for doing live journalism, because it's not journalism. So, so we have to rely 100% on ticket sales, and, and it, there's a lot of work in these shows, as you can imagine. So, so, so we use it to to make our uh, members uh, into like to, to get a very strong relationship with them and, and turn them into ambassadors, to, to to spread the word about what we're doing and, and to have like a somewhat small group, but that is very highly engaged, um, and that's that that spreads at least in a small country like Denmark. Yuri, when we've spoken before, you've talked, you, you sort of said that actually you weren't thinking about, you didn't want to create a membership tier within Dabali. And can you talk a bit more about why you wouldn't want to do that? Well, um, in a way, um, people keep suggesting that to me all the time because we are, you could say we are a club, you know, because we have, um, it, it's an old building, we have a restaurant, we have a, a pub, we have a hall with, uh, with, with panelled. Um, it's a great hall because it's, you can talk in it because it's built for it in 1819. As a, as a courthouse, so, you, so it's built to, to be talked to people. But it, you could make it easily into, well, uh, people say always to me, you can, why don't you ask memberships? I don't like that because I think we are as open as possible. Um, uh, everybody should come in. Uh, it's a very low ticket price. It's not even the price of, a, of if you go to the, to the cinema. So if you, if you pay for a, um, a, a million times repeated Disney product, you know, 15 euros, and for a live cooked event, 10 euros. So it's it's very very cheap. And, well, when and, when we spoke, I mean, I I asked you who you think your competitors are, and I did not expect the answer, The Hobbit. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my my competitors are not other podia. I mean, um, we do sometimes things in a big theater, 1500, but normally we have a 200 seated. Uh, that's our normal venue, uh, that's our own venue. So, I mean, the, the competition is uh, the, the, the birthday of your aunt and the Hobbit. And because if you are um, a real life journalist, it cannot be possible that you cannot do something which is not interesting to 200 people in the city. I mean, if you, if you can't get 200 people, you should take another job. So your competition is, is t television, is, is, is the Hobbit, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and about membership, I think it's the wrong message. I think a stage like this need to be as open as possible. So um, uh, it's not a club. So then what happens, I mean, and this is more directed at the Dutch end of the table, if you like, where I think <laughs> that... The, the <laughs> um, okay, it's space. Uh, not everyone remembers to switch off their phone. Uh, um, so uh, we've talked about <laughs> so uh, you know we've talked a bit about it being an open space. You know, the, the Bali's designed as an open space, and you've also talked about this unfiltered sort of mediation. I I want to get into the politics of this. What happens? You know, like you've said, you explicitly touched Joris on the the political space there and the relationship, for example, between populist voters and liberal progressive journalists and what happens in that meeting when you're bringing people together or when you're bringing controversial speakers to an open audience in Dabali or you're you know you're talking with very very sensitive topics Bataclan as you're talking about you know uh, Florence so you've got you can have highly sensitive or highly charged topics highly uh, polarized things, and you're bringing people into contact, you talked a little bit about the security dimension, but in a sense I want to talk about the, this 
this charge that happens between people who are of opposing opinions, violently opposed opinions sometimes. Uh, you know, and what, that, what happens in that space when you're doing it as, as live? We've seen it happen in lots of other media and we've seen it in news formats and everything else, but this is something very, very different. So what's different and what's difficult and what's a dilemma and what, well, do, you, what do you want to think through about that? There's a very important difference with normal journalism there because, because if you have people from the from across the aisle, from the left and right, if you have um, uh, atheists and, 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 and uh, devout Muslims uh, talking to each other and accusing each other of things, um, it can be very sort of edgy to say the least. It can be sort of scary. But the good thing is that you cannot trick people. They, they need to trust you to come. So you cannot really trick them as normal journalists can because you can murder them behind your desk. So you can write everything you like because he's no longer the, he or she is no longer there. But they are actually there. So you so you you need to um, to tell them first. They trust need to trust you first to come, and you have to to keep that trust right till the end. Um, so if you promised that um, uh, he uh, there there was an imam with, who whom didn't want to uh, shake hands with women. And I said, okay, we, we, uh, if you want to come, we will, we will uh, make sure that, you, that you're not going to. I announced that on stage, that we had this uh, agreement. Some people got angry. Um, others said, you know, and some people liked it because it was one of the ways to get him there and to be able to talk to each other. But you, you have to explain and be open about um, uh, what you have had to do to, get, to gain the trust. And you have to keep the trust all through the night because otherwise um, uh, uh, people will... And that's very, very um, um, uh, interesting and can be very difficult. You have to, have to think all the time whether you will promise this or that or not or yes. Or, and that's, that's, I think, part of... Um, why it's why live journalism can do something for building trust, like Jura said. You know, we're not trusted, or like 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 you said. And part of it is be, that because it's been overseen by the public, and everybody's there, so you you can hold everybody accountable to the to the to the uh, appointments and, and 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 promises you you made. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah. Picking up on the political aspect, uh, one thing I learned when I did a sort of a similar project. Uh, more online uh, with populist voters, is that uh, the invitation to a dialogue with um, people of lo low education is not a neutral one. Because they are, if you're highly educated, you've been trained for 20 years in winning dialogues. And if you're not educated, then basically you, you enter the boxing ring wearing nothing. And so there is already an inequality between the untrusted journalist from the liberal elite and, say, the dock worker. So it requires real thought on how to uh, prevent um, as, uh, yeah, the, the easy victories. You get, because it's, you're, uh, I, I studied anthropology, I, I am just primed to find little inconsistencies and just go, <laughs> that's my job, that's our job as journalists. But if you're trying to regain the trust or trying to really understand what the world looks like for a dock worker who votes for populist, that doesn't work. So you also have to really take a step back and reevaluate your own role. Um, and then there's the problem of the audience that if you would do this in live form, and this is why I chose not to do it in live form with populist voters, is that the audience is very likely to belong to your own liberal elite. And so you'd also need the composition of the audience to, to reflect a, a balance, because it easily becomes a court and, and a very adversarial. And this is why I personally often prefer the web, where you don't have this, these dynamics that a, a winner has to be declared. That, 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 that's, that, that's really, and that depends on how you program, because um, the Bali is, of course, in Amsterdam, and Amsterdam has less left-wing voters in majority and st stuff like that, and the Bali especially maybe as an audience. But uh, if we invite Nigel Farage, um, more than half the audience, we did, and more than half the audience was uh, in favor of Farage, which was sort of a very unsettling moment for our staff and for me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it, it was suddenly that I realized that, more, that, that at least half of the public um, uh, 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 you know, agreed with him. And so it depends on who you put on stage, um, uh, uh, even in a city like Amsterdam. And that's very interesting, I think. That's a very interesting moment, that you realize that uh, uh, everybody on the staff is on the other side of your own audience.
A view. Oh. Yeah. I had one more question, really very quickly, just about the ch the experiment with the the outreach program that you're doing with the children. Are you finding that there's a different dynamic there because you're talking about the banlieue? You've actively taken the format to a different arena. I mean, uh, why did I started this? Is because I think we need to reach out to people who don't uh, who are different from us. And what I found out after a few shows is just I knew. Even in, the, I knew everybody. They were, in fact, it was uh, a bit unsettling, and yeah. So it's a kind of a militant thing to do. Plus, it's also for the journalists. A lot of journalists are having a hard time in France. They're let out, or some things are very formatted. It's competitive. It's difficult, and it's a, it's a really a moment for them um, to reevaluate their own uh, journalism, and their, it, it gives them energy, really, and. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of virtuous for, and we really do that because we believe the, of the political thing of journalism. We, we need to do something, I suppose, to, teach new, to, to reach out to new people in a different ways. Okay. So questions, are there questions from the audience? Do we have a mic, a roving mic, or has Jacob taken it? Yeah, vas-y, Jacob. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah? Yeah. Right. I have a question for Mr. Albrecht. Um, you said that when you had Nigel Farage in the Bali, um, half of the audience were in favor of him. But don't you also want to have those people in the audience when you have someone on stage who's left-wing, when you have Jude Law on stage? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, you you, you would like to have that, um, uh, uh, and but and but that's, um, and the way you program your um, the, the way you program your panel or your evening or your um, uh, helps there, and with which organizations you work, you have to think all the time. If I work with um, um, the network of uh, uh, Antillean Dutch, um, you know they. And, and if we work with this, or you have to choose your partners all the time to get um, a, a broader audience. But that's that's one of the biggest challenges to get a mixed audience to a uh, uh, and and the other side listening to uh, uh, the others. But for instance, with the Farage uh, event, we had uh, of course um, uh, not only Farage there; there were several other uh, uh, speakers. Um, so that was interesting. Half of the half of the audience was booing the other half. Of the so so if you if you, but it takes. It, it's difficult because more and more people don't want to talk to the other side. Even scientists, even professors from, from universities say, um, uh, for instance, a professor who's specialized in, in contemporary Russian history will say, no, I won't talk to this and that journalist who's pro-Russian because um, you know, he's a populist and he won't. Or, or, and, but that's, of course, why you need to do it. Um, and to do it. But it's, um, uh, to my uh, um, uh, dismay, I have to say, it's getting more difficult. It's getting more difficult to get uh, uh, people from the other side listening to the other side, even if you, pro if you try to program them together. But if you, try, if you really program sort of excellent speakers from all sides together, you will get, a, at least in Amsterdam, you get a very mixed audience. And that's very interesting indeed. Grazie. Yeah. Posso fare la domanda in italiano? Viene tradotta? Sì? No, non lo parlare. Ok, I would like uh, to know the business model, because I understand... Ok, business model, eh, ho capito che soprattutto su sponsorship e biglietti non mi è chiaro nel, nell'iniziativa delle Fiandre, dove è l'ingresso economico. La seconda domanda è per Florence, per Live Magazine. Eh, volevo sapere il lavoro che sta alle spalle del, eh, dello show. Quindi, eh, se vengono preparati gli interventi, non c'è traduzione. <laughs> Who can translate for me like in English? Maybe somebody can. Okay. I would like to know to, um, to Florence the work behind the show. What uh, the journalists do, they select the stories, uh, they help uh, people uh, to uh, explain the story on the stage. Uh, and how do we, so basically, how do we edit the stories? <laughs> We put an enormous amount of time into doing this. It is like haute couture, <laughs> I tell you. So, um, yeah, they, they, we. 
it's very intuitive. We have like we think about it all the time. Every time we listen to the radio, or we we try to find new people, new ways. Uh, we also I didn't mention, but we pay all the authors who come on stage, so that I mean, that, so we're very happy to be able to do that. Uh, Sometimes they, so I, they basically I organize little dinner parties at my place and so uh, we hang out a lot and we try to find the best form for the best stories and usually I see them maybe two, three, four times then we think in terms of stage we have somebody who comes from the theater who helps us try to do the mise-en-scene part of it. Um, what else? Sometimes they see a coach. We try to be as free and unformatted as possible. To, Really, and we try to fact check everything at the same time. Voila. Can you add something? We always, we always like take each story and, and pair a, a storyteller or somebody who's responsible for what's going on on stage with, with somebody from our own organization as an editor. And then they have like a process of, 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 of writing and, and editing and, and practicing and and practicing again, and, and, and to be honest, many journalists are not very used to or comfortable in, 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 in thinking about how they perform. But, but the wonderful thing is that it's really, really a great experience for them always, because they, they, have, they, 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 get this, this, they, they get to a place where they tell a story and get this immediate reaction in a, in a huge theater, and, and it's... Um, they feel the love, really? Yes, they, they feel, feel the love, the and, love. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful after the show, typically, because people are, are totally high, like, like they're not used to being, really, uh, sometimes doing like serious analytical journalism, for instance. I would like to dig a little deeper uh, into what works when you want to uh, get people to talk to, to together. <laughs> Joris, could you uh, share what uh, worked in your Kun vi praten uh, project with the Gerd Wilders voters? What made them uh, come forward and uh, how would you work on that? Because I think we have a French election coming up where we could use that. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think what, what worked really well is to, uh, I started out with uh, long monologues of about 2,000 words where I would try to present the, the populist voter as a three-dimensional person. And I would start out with, with uh, aspects of their per personality or views or life history that would probably match with those of my liberal readers. And so they would start out, you know, feeling in spite of themselves probably some sympathy. And then the, the views would come, but the views would would have to be based on experiences. So what happened in your life practically for you to think that the best way forward for the Netherlands is a Wilders victory? And because views are very, people, people pick them up, but experiences are unique. And if you're going to talk about experiences, um, in a, in a, even if you criticize, it's very difficult to criticize what has happened to somebody. And so that the basis for the conversation is different. And then when the liberal elite um, readers began to respond, it was really interesting how a number, a small minority, but very loud minority, did everything they could to sabotage the exchange. So there is there's vast intolerance also on the part, but it's, it's just a tiny group. And I find that among the populist voters too, it seems there's a tiny group that's very loud. They're the sort of professional populist voters who will appear in the media and who, who don't mind the threats or enjoy the threats that come. Uh, but there's this silent majority of populist voters who seem to be much more in doubt and struggling and open and, and varied and, uh, and diverse than I had expected. So it seems that, that often that we other, we as liberal elite, other populist voters, the way we think populist voters, other Muslims. Okay, I'm afraid we have to draw it to a close. I think we could probably talk about this for several more hours. And I don't know about you, but I just, I'm completely in love with everything all of these people are doing. <laughs> and I think a revolution is coming. So, <laughs> thank you.